Good morning, everybody. It's good to see your smiling faces on a cold day. You know, there's nothing like hot coffee and happy and a kind faces on a cold day. So there we go. The uh, good faces are probably a little bit better. But we're going to worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah.
hills and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hand. Could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hand, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I know when the world has seen the light, they will dance like joy while we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever, I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every 
chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. All sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price. Born on redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. There is power in the name. Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus, to break every chain, 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 break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. We're here to publicly repent. It was dumb. It was didn't mean anything. It, well, I didn't mean it as an offense. I wanted to have a discussion about something, and it, he took offense. And then I got frustrated, so I went to bed frustrated, and we didn't heal it before bed. And it wasn't a big deal. It was a little little thing, but little things turn into big things. So to break every chain in our life and the woundings in our soul. We got to admit what's really going on. Are you bitter towards somebody today? Are you frustrated? Are you recalling in your mind over and over again what they've spoken to you? Were you offended by a little something somebody said? Your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your child. You got bitterness in your heart. It doesn't matter what was said. What matters is that we get the wounding in our soul healed and we need to repent of the offense. If we are easily offended, we are missing out the agape love 
for love hardly even notices when wrong is done to it. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So I forgive my husband for taking offense to what he said and... doesn't matter because I still went to bed frustrated and we should have just healed it and last I night also for not and then the enemy didn't want me here this morning I lost my keys I never lose my keys he's the one that loses his keys so and I lost an employee this week so I've got to work today you know it just so many things happen the enemy didn't want me here today I'm telling you God's getting ready to break through at the ridge in a big way we are going to see change broken off people in this place angelic host is coming to war on our behalf and those lord god that need healing in their soul to show them show them show them what needs to be repented of and show them where they need the healing love of the power of god and i'm here i will pray with any one of you john will too and just as we are praying for our spiritual hearts we pray today for rob we say lord god touch his broken physical heart that heart attack yesterday will be used of you in order to bring supernatural healing supernatural healing into rob that he would have a visitation of jesus in that hospital room that lord god that you would touch him body soul and spirit you restore his mind and that no plan of the enemy to steal kill and destroy him would go forth but lord we proclaim life and life more abundant for rob in jesus name break every chain there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, 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 break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We sing the name of Jesus this morning. Praise the name of our Savior Jesus. The name above all names is Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. There is power in that name. Resurrection and the life. There is power in the name of Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, our risen Savior. Thank you, Lord. God's word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land if my people who are called by my name that's us <laughs> we say we're his <laughs> he gave his life for us and he wants our lives laid down for him that's the humble part that's the humble part God not what I want but what you want, 
what you want, God. And to know what you want, I gotta talk to you. I gotta pray. I gotta say, I don't know it all. <laughs> and it's okay if I don't get what I want. I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna seek your face, God. And then we can turn from our wicked ways. If we don't know him and we don't seek him, we can't turn from our wicked ways. So we gotta know him. <laughs> We got to talk to him. We got to say, come in. Moses asked to see his face, but God said, you can't see my whole face. It would kill you. But I will shelter you in the lee of a rock, and you can see part of me. We want to see him. We want to know him. We want to know his heart and hear his voice. We need to seek him, church. I'll confess I'm bad at it. I'm bad at it. But you know what? Everything I'm bad at, he can do in me. He can do. I would say the chain for me is to just really seek him. Because if I'm really, really, really seeking him with all of my heart, I can turn. <laughs> and he can heal not only me, but my land. And my land needs healing. So let's seek him, church. Let's seek him. If we know him, everything is possible. Lord, we thank you that you've made yourself available to us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, in this moment as we worship you, that you are quick to respond to your people. You are quick to hear. You are quick, Lord God, to be in the midst, Lord. And we thank you, Lord God, in this place for your presence, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we can know you and that you've opened up that door. And we pray that you continue to lead and guide us in this time together, that you are going to interact with us, Lord God. And once again, we have not gathered here together to find more information about you. We've come here to meet with you with full expectation that you are going to come down from the heavens, minister in the midst, and be here, oh God. Great and mighty are you, Lord, and we bless your name. We thank you that you are a good, good Father. We bless you in this place. We bless you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Break every chain. Hallelujah. Why don't you take a few minutes? And once again, we're going to. And I want to thank all of you for being here today on a chilly January Midwest day. But uh, you guys are the hardcores, and uh, we're here to worship the Lord. And we're especially uh, glad to see if you're a first-time guest with us. We, uh, that means a lot to us that you took the time to be with us today. And we would be delighted if you could take a minute. Hopefully you got a little packet when you came in from our greeters. And um, the, uh, um, there's a little Connect card in there with just a couple things on there. Uh, we'd love to know just a little bit more about you. If you'd be willing to fill that out, we're going to take an offering in just a minute. And if, uh, we would be so happy if you would uh, do that. But we're so glad you're here. And immediately following this service, we will have more fellowship time over here in what's called the Fellowship Hall. There's a connection between those two, fellowship time and fellowship hall. So uh, we like to encourage you not to be in a hurry to leave. We have coffee and some treats and things over there for you. A few things to make you aware of coming up. Uh, on February 7, I'm going to have a class uh, following the service. We'll have a meal along with this. For anybody who'd be interested in being a new member, I've already got five people signed up. I'm so excited. And uh, if you would like to be a member and haven't signed up yet, uh, please let me know. And this doesn't, this does not, um, uh, this does not uh, um, tie you in. This is so you're checking us out. And we're kind of checking you out too. Let you know what that means. Membership. You're not committing to anything at this. It's but uh, if you're interested, we will have, uh, we'll go through that with you. So that's going to happen on February seven. Um, and then we have our annual meeting for everybody in the church. This is required for members but it's open to everybody that is a part of this body uh, following the service on the 21st. In between there on the 14th, I'd like to have a baptism service. A few people have told me they had interest in being baptized. Um, if that is you or if you know somebody that is, please contact me and let me know. And uh, that would be uh, just terrific. That's always such an exciting time when we're able uh, to do that. Uh, core for our young adults, age 18 to 27, meeting on Wednesday nights here at 6.30 every week with food, and I want to encourage you to be a part of that. If you have any questions about that, we always have uh, Reese and Megan here over here. They can answer questions for you, and uh, that's great. And the women will be meeting this week on Saturday at 4 o'clock, continuing their study on lies that women believe. Men's study is meeting tonight, 
at 6. And uh, we also, just to remind you, Sunday school going on every week um, at 9 o'clock over here, also in the fellowship hall. And uh, we will have our prayer meeting this week on Thursday morning at the Wrights Home on Langwood Boulevard. So I think that's it. Looking around, did I miss anything or is there anything new popping up? All right, nobody's waving at me and I think we're good to go. So I'm going to ask that our ushers come forward as we prepare to give to the Lord today uh, with our uh, morning offering. And um, just thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I'm kind of wondering what I said or did. We've got like three rows here. Nobody's here except Julia. She's the closest one, but uh, I don't know what happened there. But um, let's pray. Father, we give our gifts to you. We give it as an offering. We give it with joy. We give it in thanksgiving. And we give it because uh, you've asked us to, Lord. We give out of what you've given us, which is everything. And we pray that you take every dime of this and use it to advance your kingdom in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. As I take the offering, let me just share with you briefly. Um, I spent a long time yesterday, uh, I don't know how this happened, but we had a chaplain that was very, very uh, gracious and helpful at Parkview North and allowed me to go in the hospital with uh, Kendra, and I was with her in the hospital. They usually don't allow that, but Rob had a massive heart attack uh, yesterday morning. Uh, what's kind of interesting that... Um, Kendra couldn't sleep, so she's sleeping out on the couch, which is right by their, you know, in their front room. And Rob had taken the dogs out and was on the um, porch, and he collapsed while he was with the door. And if she had not been out there, he would have died. But she saw him. She learned how to do CPR back in junior high and called 911, and they worked her through it, and she saved his life and got him to the hospital. And he was still, his condition was very iffy when we got there. He was, he was in really, really bad shape, but they had two doctors working on him. And she called me this morning, and the situation right now is um, they, um, his heart seems to be okay. There's a, a huge blockage, and they were able to actually open him up and take care of that yesterday. Uh, their concern is, you know, when you have, um, they had to keep doing CPR on him and doing shock to get his heart going, and, and the lack of blood, they're concerned about possible brain damage. So we need to pray that that doesn't happen. So what they've done right now is they've cooled his body down, I think the 94 degrees, and they kept him there like for 24 hours to allow his heart and his brain to rest and restore. And so they'll be heating him back up later today, and that'll be a big moment to really see where we're at. But uh, let's pray. Pray for Rob. Pray for Kendra. You can imagine it's been a hard, hard thing. But I'm so glad I was there. We were in this huge waiting room, and there's nobody there. There's not even desk people there. I mean, there's nobody there in this giant room. And if they wouldn't have let me in there, she would have been there for hours all by herself. So I'm really thankful I could be there with her. But uh, let's just keep praying for her and holding her up. So as a matter of fact, Eileen prayed, but let me just pray again. Father, we pray for this family. And we pray for our brother Rod, that your hand will be on him and that you will completely restore, Father God. Out of your love and your mercy and your power, we just ask that you do it, oh God. And we pray for the family. I pray for, for Kendra and pray that just help her to, to, be able to, um, to be able to sense our love for her and your love and your grace on her life right now. Hold her up, Father God. And we just pray you bless our sister and the family, Lord God, for Jason, Lord God, and Patty and Jerrica, Lord God. And I pray that they will see your hand at work and that you will minister in their lives as well today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, we began looking at a little-known prophet from the Old Testament named Haggai. He appeared after the people of Israel had returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of exile in the land of Babylon. A small contingent had come back, and they set right to work on rebuilding the temple. They laid out the foundation. We looked at all this last week. And then everything ground to a halt. They were surrounded by enemies that threatened them. And then the king of Persia, Cyrus, was talked into issuing a decree to stop the work. Furthermore, their harvests had been terrible and financial resources were scarce. So for 16 years, the foundation lay gathering dust along with the hopes and dreams of the people of Israel. Then they began to focus on building their own homes and tried to forget about the temple. And it was into this situation that our prophet arises and says, it's time to build. And you remember how the Lord broke down all the obstacles 
There was a new sheriff in town. Cyrus had been replaced. Der, uh, the, the king of Persia was now Darius. And Darius encouraged them with words, with decrees, and with finances to get the building going again. And he also forbade their enemies from hindering them. Furthermore, the Lord himself said that he was the one that had been holding back the harvest because of their disobedience. And everything would change as they learned to walk in obedience. The Lord broke down every one of the obstacles, of the attacks and the the impediments from the outside. And now the prophet is going to have to deal with the most difficult barriers of all. And that is the barriers on the inside. It's going to take a little time for these internal problems to surface, but the difficulties will indeed arise, and Israel will face a choice of what they're going to do. So please turn with me this morning, if you have a Bible, to the book of Haggai, if you can find it. Once again, it's the third last book in the Old Testament. You go to Matthew and turn left, and you go over three. Malachi is very short, Zechariah is a little longer, and then Haggai is very, very short. The book of Haggai, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're going to pick up at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Notice that they refer to the Lord as the Lord our God. I didn't point this out last week, but when we were looking last week at verse 2, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, these people say, notice the way he talked about them. He didn't say my people. (laughs) He said these people. He was mad at them. Um, But there seems to have been a change of heart. So verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Now let's stop here for a moment. I am with you is the foundational promise that God gives to his people. The most striking feature in Haggai's message is the repeated appeal to the Lord as the source of his word. In some form, he uses the word um, or uses the appeal, thus says the Lord or the word of the Lord of hosts or a similar expression, 26 times in this short book, 26 times out of just 37 verses, he's appealing to thus says the Lord, or the Lord says, or this is his word. Heavenly power is wrapped up in the words, I am with you. Some people on the outside look at biblical Christianity as a religion that um, with a lot of condemnation, a lot of don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that. And unfortunately, a lot of people inside the church see it that way too. The book of Haggai is one of the best examples of how God tries to steer us away from disobedience, not to be a spoil sport as a harsh, judgmental kind of being who loves to criticize and hurt us, but as a father who wants to protect us from the devastating consequences of sinful choices. And in the midst of this, he is always offering himself to us, like the good father that he is. How can you interpret, I will be with you in any way other than positive? That's a positive thing. I'm going to be with you. And this attitude from the Lord carries right across into the New Testament. We see it there too, don't we? You think about Jesus when he's giving the great commission to the disciples, and he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and he goes on and on. How does that end after he gives the commission? And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here back with Haggai, God likewise gave his people a huge assignment, but from the get-go, he promises to be with them. He's not sending them out on their own with a harsh follow-up visit to come at an unexpected time in the future. He will be with them throughout, and he will be giving them divine resources along the way. As a matter of fact, look at the next verse 14, even before we read it. The Lord is referred to as the Lord Almighty. The Hebrew name 
is Yahweh Sabaoth. We're one behind, guys. Put that up right there so we can see that. Oh. Oh, one more, one thirteen. So if you can just hit the 13 and go in there. This can be translated, the Lord of hosts. Some translations say it that way. And what by this it means, the Lord of the hosts of the heavenly army. Here the Lord is represented as the divine warrior. He is able and ready to fight for us. This phrase, this name of God is used 14 times in these two short chapters. There's an emphasis here that in the moment of need, the Lord is armed and ready to do battle for us. He's given his people a big job that's going to face a lot of opposition. But he's already in place to contend on behalf of his people. Verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. And we looked at the major players here last week. In addition to Ezra the priest and Haggai the prophet, we have Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua the high priest. They represent the political and spiritual leadership of the people. And we must give all the people some credit, at least a little credit as well. After all, you remember that only a fraction of the people returned to Jerusalem when the opportunity was given to them. Most of them stayed behind in Babylon, never came at all. And we see something here that is very, very rare in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord came to the people from the prophet, and they obeyed it right away. We never see that, do we? Prophets are always wringing their hands and getting thrown into a dungeon and going to God saying, nobody's listening to me. But here, the people responded. Last week, the directive from the prophet to build the temple in the very first verse of the book came on the first day of the sixth month. Here, they began the work on the 24th day of the sixth month. If you're good at math, that's a mere 23 days later. Of course, if you're not good at math, it's still 23 days later. If you've ever worked on a building project, you know that it takes, um, it takes time to gather, miracle, to gather materials together and to prepare the building site. So we can assume the people went to work on the temple immediately so that the work could actually begin three weeks later. They obeyed the voice of the Lord as they recognized that the Lord had indeed been speaking to them. And this was a big turning point for them. Notice it says their spirits, their spirits were stirred up. God did not stir them up emotionally or even mentally or psychologically. These things would be impacted as they're stirred up spiritually. There is going to be some emotion and there's going to be some thinking going on. But he stirred them in their spirits, in their hearts. You can have all the good intentions in the world. But nothing motivates us like the heart. Back when I was 24 years old, if my 22-year-old brother would have called me up in the middle of a January night and it's 15 degrees out and said, I got a flat tire, come help me. I would help him very grudgingly. What's wrong with you? How do you end up here? Now at the same time, this beautiful young lady named Eileen I just met called me up at the same time and said she had a flat tire. I would have wished it were 10 degrees colder so she could see just how much I loved her to come out and change that tire. We get motivated by the heart like nothing else. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of the people. But once again, to give them some credit, they had to be in a position to have their spirit stirred up. There, had, there needed to be at least an openness and some love for God, something that he could latch his reach onto as he reached out to them. 
So now we come to chapter 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Now stop right there for a moment. The book of Haggai is one of the few places in the, in the Bible that can be dated, or in the Old Testament, that can be dated with absolute accuracy. There are four messages that are given in this book, and they were all delivered over the course of four months. The first, which we saw last week, was given in September of 520 B.C. Today's prophecy was given a month later, in October of 520 B.C. And then the last two were given in December of that same year, and they were both given on the same day. Now, this particular date, the 21st day of the seventh month, was significant on the Jewish calendar. We see from the book of Ezra that the people had been motivated to get the temple started, and they were already beginning to try to celebrate the feasts and, the, and go through with the things that were required by the law and to establish temple worship as much as possible. So we're on day 21 of the seventh month. The Day of Atonement, the High and Holy Day, was held 11 days earlier. It is held on the 10th day of the seventh month. After five days, or, and five days after the Day of Atonement, which we call Yom Kippur, we come to the Feast of Tabernacles. This feast begins on the 15th day of the seventh month, but it lasts for seven days. It ends on the 21st. And it ends, if you read about this in Leviticus, it ends with a closing ceremony, a sacred assembly. So this is the day that the word has come to the people of God. Everybody would be there. The community has gathered together. Verse 2, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like, or does it seem to you like nothing? Here is the people have begun to visualize what they were building was actually going to look like as it took shape. They became discouraged. The Lord spoke to them of what some of them were already thinking. This is going to be a disaster. <laughs> It was going to be terrible. They had heard reports of Solomon's splendid temple, which they were trying to replace. The original with all of its gold adornment. They had also seen the elaborate temples and palaces in Babylon during their days in captivity. And they knew that they were poor and they could never compete with their own past glory or the splendor of those other nations. And as we've seen, there were actually some of them there who had been alive before the exile and had seen the original temple. And they had been discouraging the others by throwing a wet blanket on everything. You know, if you want to dampen a project and discourage people, all you got to do is say, oh, you think this is something? You should have seen it back in the good old days. And that's what the older people were doing. That didn't help. And the problem is they felt like they had had in the past something comparable to what we would call a cathedral. Big, beautiful, amazing place. And now they were constructing something on the order of Green Acres. <laughs> in comparison with the former temple, would most surely... Nobody sing that song, please. Comparison with the former temple would most surely lead to the wrong impression. Because you know what? A man of 80 is not going to see things the way a boy of 12 would anyway. Um, I have a friend of mine, many years ago, found out that there was a VW van for sale. You remember these things? And everybody smiles. You know, you go, wasn't that cool? And that's what he thought. It's like, man, I had one of these back in the day. This is going to be so cool. And so I went with him and we got in there and started driving it around. You could just see this look in his face. It's like, this, this glorified vehicle that I thought about, it's not this. There's nothing wrong with the car. It was working the way it was supposed to. But we, we get these images that it was just such this amazing thing. And, of course, our technology has changed, and everything is different. And you get in it, and it's like the ride isn't as good, and there's, water, there's air coming through everywhere. And it's just 
Nostalgia just paints a, a picture that's just not realistic. And my friend got that. He didn't buy the car. The idea of how good things were in the good old days can really be deceiving. Was the people of Haggai lamented and were feeling down? The prophet had another word of God for them. Verse 4, Now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord Almighty. There it is again. I am with you. It's almost like God really means it. And he encourages them. To Zerubbabel, he says, be strong. To Joshua, the high priest, he says, be strong. And all the people, he says, be strong and work. The Lord will be there to empower and to guide and to protect. But they still need to put their hand to the plow and move forward. You probably heard the story about the guy who bought a new Winnebago. And uh, this was back in the day when, when this was a still a new thing, but he's coming home on the freeway, and it's got cruise control, so he sets it on cruise, cruise control, and then he goes in the back to make a cup of coffee, and it runs off the road and crashes, and then he tries to sue Winnebago for saying, you didn't tell me that it wouldn't drive itself. <laughs> now, you may have heard that story. Um, actually, that never happened. That is an urban legend. As a matter of fact, if you go out on the internet, some of the stories will tell you that he got $12 million from that. It did, did not happen. But anyway, we need to work. God does the heavy lifting in our spiritual battles. He gives us guidance, but we can't just walk away to make coffee in the back. We need to work and do what we know how to do and trust God to empower and bless the work of our hands. But we trust him to Trust him with the work of our hands, and this doesn't mean sitting on them. You know, doesn't say, good Lord, bless my hands, help it to do, you know. Can't be sitting on our hands. So, again, we go to verse 5. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Here the Lord looks back on the covenant he made with Moses and the children of Israel. They're still his people. And time has not diminished his covenant with them. There wasn't a, there wasn't a, a time out on this. And again, he reminds them of his ongoing presence. My spirit remains among you and do not fear. God's people should not have to fear since we belong to him and he's made such outlandish promises to us. On our behalf, promises not only to protect us and to provide for us, but to be with us and to remain in us. Yet with so many followers of Jesus that live in ongoing fear, we don't have to have that. We don't have to live there. We don't have to go there. Verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. God is powerful. He can shake nations. He's shaking them right now, isn't he? Not only America, he's shaking all over the world. He kind of likes to show his stuff. He can do this, and he can shake things up politically, and he can use all of it to accomplish his purposes on this earth. That's why he shakes them. We don't need to be afraid of that. It's true now, and it was true back then. He's trying to show them that he's got the big picture. He's got the whole world in his hands. I don't know why that phrase keeps coming up as I'm looking at this, but that's what God is telling him. I've got this. I've got this. And then he says, what is desired by all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. Some translations put it this way, the desire of nations will come. Now, for a long time it was thought that this referred to the Messiah, but it doesn't. Um, The verb form, the scholars tell us, is a plural plural word, and and it cannot point to a single person or a single thing. So what is the desire of nations? What do they want? 
silver and gold. Look at verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. God says, don't worry about what this temple looks like on the outside. All of the silver and gold in the world belongs to me. And wherever, whenever I would like, I can call for it and get it right here. And almost exactly 500 years later, he did just that. God would extract all the money needed from Herod and the Romans to have the temple rebuilt to its original gorgeous glory. Give or take 16 years before the birth of Jesus, the deed would be done because it all belongs to God. Verse 9, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. The people of Haggai's day could not possibly imagine that the glory of their reconstructed temple made out of wood and stone could come anywhere close to its original splendor. But there's some things that they overlooked. First, God could and would restore its gold and its brilliance, as we've just seen. But that's only the surface. You know, as God told Samuel when he went looking for a king, he says, man looks at the outward appearance. What were they looking at? They've got this temple. This is terrible. They're looking at the outward appearance. God said, that's not where I look. That's not where I look. The glory of the temple is the presence of the living God. A shack with God's presence inside is far superior to the most majestic cathedral with no presence of God at all. Reminds me of a story I heard about a woman who had moved into a new territory, a new place, and she saw this church. It was a beautiful church, and she thought, well, I, you know, I want to I go to this church. It would be, it would, you know, I need to find one. So she goes in there and finds the people are very cold. She goes in, nobody greets her, nobody talks to her, but she's like, well, okay. I'll. But she sits through it, and they go through the motions and do their thing, and afterwards nobody talks to her, and she comes back, and they still won't talk to her. And she goes to this, this church like for a month, nobody will talk to her. They just ignore her, you know, it's just kind of the old boys club. And one day she's just praying to God, saying, God, I don't understand. Why won't they let me into this church? And God spoke to her and said, you know, I've been trying to get into it for a long time. I can't get in either. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. The glory is when the Lord is on the inside. You know, before the temple was built, Moses, by God's instruction, had built a tabernacle, which was a portable uh, temple that they took around in the wilderness until they were established in one place to build a permanent structure. And then for a short time, David pitched a tent, just a tent. But you know what he did? He brought in the Ark of the Covenant, and he brought in and hired worshipers because I, he said, I want worship in this tent 24-7, every day of the year, day and night. It never stopped. And you know, this was probably God's favorite house. As a matter of fact, in Acts, it even talks about God will someday restore the tent of David. He looked at that and said, that's what I want, where my presence is welcome and where I can, where I can be comfortable and I can be worshiped. So the glory is in the presence of God. It may be hard to compare the splendor of the second temple to the first once it was outfitted by the gold of the Romans. They may have been nearly identical, but the greater glory would be that Jesus himself, the long-awaited Messiah, would one day walk into this temple and his glory would surpass anything ever seen before. The lesson for Haggai's people and for us is that it's better than you think. It's better than you think. They were building a temple that they were greatly disappointed with, but it was far greater and far better than they thought. They were comparing and rationalizing and failing to see the deeper picture that God was painting. They saw it only through their own eyes. They didn't see it through God's eyes. If they'd been able to see what God could see, they would have been overwhelmed for God was going to take what their hands had done, embellish it greatly, and then bring the Messiah to the temple. 
as we look at this new year, we have struggles. We know what God wants us to do as a church. We need to reach out. We need to find some way to have outreaches. We need to find some way to penetrate our neighborhoods and to tell people about Jesus. We need to make disciples that are going to make disciples. And this can seem overwhelming when we look around at what's going on in our world and what may be changing in the near future and say, where do we even begin? And you know, the other thing we do is we look at other churches. It's like, but we're so small. And look at these churches. They have these huge, huge facilities and they have all this money. They have, they have laser light shows and smoke, you know. I mean, we haven't done that and nobody's offering to pay for that, so I don't think we're going to get that. Um, you know, they got, they got this stuff and, and they're able to do so much more because they got these big programs and we look at it and say, well, 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 we're so small. What can we do? But you know what? All we need to do is to be faithful with what's in our hands right now. We have places here. We have a women's ministry, men's ministry. We have the young adults. We have wonderful children's ministry. We have, uh, we're, we're making disciples, and we're working on training ourselves how to make disciples that make disciples. We have what we need to do God's work in this place. And what we're doing may not be large, but we have faithful people that are, that are doing these things. And if we are simply faithful to the tasks that God has given us, he gives the increase. He empowers the spirit to go beyond our simple efforts and to make impact for the eternal kingdom of God. We can't give up, can't get discouraged, and then just go to the back of the Winnebago and drink coffee. Right? Because then the church will crash and burn. We dare not look at the political situation around us and say, we can't do anything the way things are. God is the one who shakes the nations, and he does it in order to bring forth his purposes. What he's doing in shaking the nations is completely congruent with his will for our church because he's in control of both of them. Look at how the world powers of Haggai's day. Think about this. I just reflected on it. This is amazing. Assyria controlling the whole world. And here's poor little Israel. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? This huge power, they control everything. And then Babylon comes in and just moves them out. And here's poor little Israel. What are we going to do? And then here comes Persia, and they just push out. And then the Greeks are going to come and push them out. Greece is going to come, and then Rome is going to come and push them out. The big kingdoms just fall by the wayside. Who endures? Israel. They're still here today. See, God can take care of his people. God can take care of his people. God's people survived it all. And this is testimony to the power of God. We need to trust him and follow him and remember that he has promised to be with us to the end of the age. Pray with me. Father, help us to hear what your spirit is saying to us, Lord God. Let us go into this year prepared to build in your kingdom and to realize, Father God, you're the one. You have ordained our work you empower it, but you are also are with us. Let us be encouraged today, even in our own individual lives, to not be afraid as we go forward, Lord God, as we face different challenges in our lives, and some face great challenges. We think again of our, our sister, Kendra, and we've had others, and with Donna here today, still going through a very deep valley, but you're with her, and you're with Kendra, and you take us through, and somehow, Lord God, somehow you, you use all this to further your kingdom, and that's all we want in our lives, to be able to further your kingdom. So give us wisdom in this new year to know the steps we need to take, but give us the oomph. Give us, stir up our spirits like you did to the people in Haggai's day, that we're going to say, we're going to follow the Lord. We're going to do his work. We're not going to be afraid and go hunker down somewhere. We're going to step into what you have given us going to glorify you and we're going to build your kingdom so let your people be empowered let them be challenged let them be encouraged today with all the things you want to do let us look into this new year with great anticipation that situations around us politically may not look good in our families things may not look good in our work things may not look good but in the kingdom everything's good 
And Lord, we want to follow you and just allow you to work out all those details in those other areas of our lives, but to realize as we walk with you, you're with us. You have a plan. You're going to take us. And we just commit ourselves in your hands today. And we thank you for that. I want to ask if everybody stand in the attitude of prayer for just a minute, and I don't want to close until we do this. If you can just keep your eyes closed for just a minute and just give an opportunity for anybody today. We're talking all about the kingdom of God, but... You know, getting into heaven isn't an automatic thing. The Bible clearly tells us some are going to go in and some are not. Not that God doesn't want everyone to go in. But we need to understand entrance to the kingdom of heaven only comes one way, and it's not by trying hard and being religious and doing all the right things, but it's by saying, I surrender. I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. And that's why our Messiah, that's why Jesus came and died on the cross, the Bible tells us, so that all of our sin can be placed on him. And the Bible says that we confess our sins and believe in our heart that he died and God raised him from the dead, that we'll be saved. So all I have to do is say, Lord, I am a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. Forgive me my sins, and I believe that Jesus took them on the cross for me. And if that is you today, you'd like to pray that prayer and say, I want to be part of the kingdom. Just raise your hand, and I'll pray for you right now. Is there anybody today that would say, that's what I want today? Wait just a moment if there's anybody. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that no matter what situations we face in the world, there is hope in you. There is hope in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break, the, to break every obstacle. Be glorified in your people. Let us go forward with great joy, great hope, great expectation. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, God bless you.